Hey, welcome to Garden Fork Radio. Thank you for downloading the show. Thank you for taking a minute for uh, me and Rick to kind of talk about what we think are interesting things here. Interest. I'm already mangling the words. But anyway, if you're familiar with Garden Fork, welcome. If not, um, it's whatever pops into our head, very DIY related. And uh, welcome and welcome, Rick. Ah, oh, good morning, my friend. How are you this morning? I have no complaints. Well, good. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, pops into our head is the uh, operative word there. We don't make a plan before we uh, start off. Unlike you and Will, which seemed to, uh, your last uh, podcast with him was brilliant. Uh, you know, talking about plumbing issues and whatnot. Um, uh, you know, you guys just seem to click, click, click from one topic to the next. Do a really good job. That's just how his brain works. He's He's amazing. He's much like... All my Garden Fork friends, um, he just found me on YouTube and then just kind of bugged me enough to where I called him on the phone. (laughs) Yeah. And, you know, Erin has been doing, uh, if you're not following Erin at The Impatient Gardener, particularly her videos, uh, you know, cleaning up the garden, some really great ideas. Uh, This is an exciting time. Uh, I have um, uh, started um, my hydroponic lettuce project because I don't think you can really trust lettuce in the stores anymore. <laughs> and it is going great guns in my uh, my grow tent. Um, I'll take some pictures and put them on the Garden Fork site. Uh, very easy to do, very cheap, uh, and they, they're just looking terrific. And I can take that tray, that uh, uh, store, plastic storage box, out of the tents anytime I want, put it outside this time of year, and they'll do really well. And then I've got all my tomatoes uh, started, um, and so I'm I'm and then a little bit later I'll do okra and uh, get okra in the back. If you got okras and tomatoes, you got everything. Yeah, actually, okra, tomato, and the vaccine. And vaccine today. You know, I, last night I could barely sleep. It was like when I was a kid, and it was the day before Christmas. You know, yeah. the twenty fourth, and you go to bed at night, and you can't sleep, and you're all excited and everything. Well, today. We wake up and about two hours, uh, we, she who must be obeyed and I will go get our uh, second vaccine. And then I also uuh, get my uh, boot taken off. I had a, you know, I think the last we time talked we talked, it. yeah, yeah I would um, had my uh, second bunion done. I did my left one earlier in the se- in the winter season. I was trying to get it all over before um, it got warm. And now I've done the uh, the second one, and today is the last day of the boot, and I will be free and clear to navigate. Look out, world! That's great. I um, I got the Moderna vaccine in New York City, and I was so excited, and it was so well run. Um, it was it was over in like seven minutes, and I was like, I, I almost forgot to take a picture. I put it, I, I did, and the the nurse who did the injection was really. I was like, yeah, let's take a picture. Yeah, that'd be great. And <laughs> I felt a little tired, and I felt like I had had too many glasses of wine the night before. And then my second vaccine, it will be April second. I'm supposed to feel a little flu like, but. Um, I talked about this in the last show, but you may not think that you need it, but we all need to help each other. There are a lot of people that can't have the, I have a friend going through a cancer treatment and they don't want him to get the vaccine because they don't know how it's going to work with this experimental cancer treatment. So we have to be, we have to help them. I got to help my buddy. So yeah. Oh yeah. I'm excited. I'm really, I was, it's been, it's been rough for everybody. And this is the light at the end of the tunnel. So, yeah, yay. I, uh, you know, I'm a, a believer in science. I am a, a, a son of the enlightenment. And I, you know, it doesn't take a lot to understand vaccines and even the new, uh, we got the Pfizer vaccine, but um, to understand how the uh, mRNA works and why there are, uh, you know, almost no risk with it. Uh, I think, um, you know, people, worry over worry about things you know it's a human condition i think we over worry about things that almost never happen and then we worry a lot or don't worry enough about things that um, are more common and so um you know i i believe in science uh, she who must be obeyed has been uh, down at the uh, convention center uh, as a volunteer giving jab to people uh, because she is a retired rn so yeah 
um, you know, just trying to uh, do our part. And uh, if everybody gets vaccinated, we can all get out of this and go back to living a, uh, a um, an interesting life. Although I have to admit, this whole experience hasn't changed my life very much. I, I t- <laughs> I'm not a very social person. I don't go out a lot. We don't. Um, we do have a, a, a dining club, uh, like uh, usually four to six military families retired that we chased each other all over the world and we kind of kept contact and we're all pretty close together here. And uh, we go out, we used to go out once a month and, and we'd go dine somewhere. Uh, and and that stopped. But I'm looking forward to starting that. But that's as much sociability as I need. I actually think that I've kind of brought you out a little bit more that you're on a, a podcast now, you know? Yeah, yeah. You have there are people that actually like you on Facebook because they're like <laughs> they like the stuff you're doing, like the lettuce hydroponic. I watched uh, a video about a gentleman had a uh, aquaculture at a koi pond. And then he had the lettuce and the little volcanic rock stuff, volcanic rock stuff. Right. And I like I knew exactly what was going on thanks to you and your sharing of that cool stuff. So. Oh well, thank you. Uh, this is a uh, actually just a straight hydroponics project. It's not a uh, an aquaponic project with fish. Uh, I just don't have the room here to um, and it, uh, it. If I put the fish out in a, a place um essentially what happens is all the seabirds come and fish out your fish uh so uh yeah we have a lot of blue heron a lot of green heron night heron here and they will come to your pond and um uh, and grab all your fish in fact uh, there was a a bank in downtown norfolk that had a big pond and they kept putting these really expensive co-op in the <laughs> in the pond <laughs> And they disappear, and they said, someone's stealing our fish. Well, they finally set up some cameras, and they caught the culprit. It was a great blue heron, and he came every day (laughs) and grabbed their fish. And they probably thought, oh, look at the pretty heron. You know, they were so glad the heron's in our pond. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, uh, oops. So, you know, uh, but uh, the hydroponics, I'm I'm getting back. I'm enthused about gardening because of my feet problems i was having trouble getting around and and uh, just kind of lost interest last year and and then the uh, of course right at planting season i had that uh, gallbladder surgery and so i just missed all of last year all all of last growing season but and you are so a I, wonder of science because you've had all these surgeries that could have been super risky back in the day and thanks to science we are like oh yeah we're gonna go take that out yeah, yeah, it's it's a little embarrassing to admit, you know. I've the uh, yeah, I got more titanium in my body than they have in the the vault somewhere. But uh, <laughs> you know, two knees, and uh, we just fixed my feet, and they uh, uh, that's a, a Home Depot or a Yellow Store project, I guess. Uh, a couple of plates and some screws in both toes, big toes. Uh, but easy uh, to recover from, not as painful as I thought it was going to be, and. Um, uh, I also have a uh, a pen in one hand that uh, holds one hand together. So, you know, uh, just think about how decades ago, uh, literally decades ago, uh, people would just have to suffer and suffer and suffer through this until they, they broke down. And now uh, science can keep you going. What do you think about $5 a month to get behind the scene photos, pictures of what Eric's been up to? Some little walk and talks about what's going on in Eric's world and more pictures of the Labradors, plus just stuff I find cool and interesting that I'm not going to post on Instagram or Facebook because I just, it's just too public sometimes, but I'm happy to share it with people that are in the world of Garden Fork. That's what my Patreon thing is all about. It's people like yourselves are kind of like modern day Medici's, Medici's, Medici's. Um, I'm going to screw that up. But basically supporting someone like myself, a content creator directly, rather than having to listen to ads for Audacity or something like that. So if you're interested, there's a link below to sign up. Or actually, there's a link below just to find out more information. You don't have to do any signing up. But it's patreon.com slash garden fork. Patreon.com slash garden fork. Thank you. So 
going on the science roll here. Uh, you wanted to talk about the science of rice cookers. Ah, okay. This is a rabbit hole. And I'll, I'll lead you down it gently and quietly. First, I started off, I caught a video on cooking the perfect scrambled eggs by Kanji, what's his name? Kenji Lopez Alt. Say and Kenji. he has a Kenji Lopez Alt, who is a noted uh, cookbook author, recipe expert, scientist. Um, his wife is a mathematician. And he has written for the New York Times, for America's Test Kitchen, Cooks Illustrated. Uh, uh, oh, the other one, I can't remember what it's called. Something Eats. And oh. he's written a book. He wrote a tome. He wrote the, the Encyclopedia of Cooking, uh, the Food Lab book. Food Lab, yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, I caught that. And the one thing I really, I, he had good, good videos always. But what I really caught and it caught my attention was he preheated his, his pan, his omelet pan or his scrambled egg pan, uh, using water. He put water in the bottom of his, uh, his frying pan and water makes sense when you think about it only boils at 212 degrees. It will not go above 212 degrees at sea level. Um, uh, instead it boils more furious, furiously. And so then he pours the water out, drops in a pad of butter and it foams immediately without browning. And the pan is perfectly heated to do your, um, your, um, Eggs. eggs. And so, so the that, pan isn't overheated and exactly, browning the butter. Exactly. You know, I have uh, heated a pan so hot that my butter just kind of flambéed when I... <laughs> 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 so uh, that, that was a first cool tip. And then I saw a video about how rice cookers work. And that, I mean, you this is a $10 device you can get in, you know, any store. And you would think that it was just the most mundane thing possible. And I love the uh, extraordinariness of mundane things. And that little springy thing in the bottom of a rice cooker that's under the pan has a metal cap on it. And when you lift the lever, it sticks a magnet to the bottom of that cap. And then that completes the circuit and heats the water. Well, this works on the same principle of water cannot boil at any greater temperature than 212 degrees. And then it makes use of the fact that once the water has boiled away, the rice that's left can cook at a higher temperature. And so magnets lose their magnetism uh, at certain temperatures and you can engineer that and they've engineered those magnets so that once the temperature goes up to about uh, 220 degrees or so the magnet won't stick to that little metal thing and the springy doodad in the middle this is a very technical discussion and it falls away and it takes the heat off and it goes into the warm cycle and that is just an amazing use of everyday physics or actually high-end physics uh, that you can find in your grocery store or in your uh, appliance store for 10 bucks. And it's, it's one of the most amazing things possible. And yeah, I just, um, you know, I think that's so cool. <laughs> yeah. I, um, I actually have the, a fancier instant pot now. And I thought it used like fuzzy logic to cook the rice. Mm -hmm. So I, trashed my ten dollar rice cooker uh actually boiling down a uh, beeswax <laughs> and and then i i used the instant pot and uh, you know yeah, i was pressing the buttons and i read in the book and they're like oh well just type in a number for how long you want it to cook i'm like no this is supposed to be i thought it was supposed to be automatic where it did the sensing of moisture versus the how how fast the temperature starts to rise because the water is being boiled out of the rice and maybe I have not the there might be an instant pot that does that someone an instant pot person is yelling back at the podcast right now by the way a, mm. a Wi-Fi expert was yelling back at the podcast last week from Canada and he's going to be on the show next week I um, want to hear that I, <laughs> I I really want to learn more about mesh networks particularly okay. So anyway, I want to go back to the $10 rice cooker because I love the crunchy rice around the bottom and the edge. 
Right. And that's because the temperature goes up some and it you know, dries that rice out to crunchy before the uh, magnet lets loose and drops away. Yeah, it's um, it's really kind of phenomenal. So two points here. You started making brown rice because you stopped eating pasta. Sure. Um, and uh, more than that, we eat uh, and I'll I think it's Lungford. They're a rice company yep. out of California, uh, more expensive. But uh, for a lot of different reasons, rice that's grown in the South tends to have a lot of arsenic in it. And so if you're going to eat uh, a lot of rice, probably get the organic rice out of California where they didn't grow cotton. Uh, when I was a kid uh, growing up in cotton country on the plains, um, they would use uh, arsenic to defoliate the cotton before the pickers came through and picked it. Right. And all through the South, a lot of places have been converted into dryland rice instead of cotton, but that arsenic is still in the soil. And so it's, if you eat a lot of rice, you best think about maybe thinking about some organic rice out of the, off the West coast where they didn't use the arsenic. But, um, how did we get there? Well, um, because you're doing brown rice, and then oh, I was, yeah. was going to ask you about your weight loss. Oh, well, um, I stopped drinking uh, almost two years ago, Yay. two years September. Yay! Well, I kind of don't like it, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, yeah, I've been eating rice, brown rice, instead of uh, when we make a tomato sauce or uh, we'll do a jambalaya or something, instead of pasta, uh, we'll have uh, brown rice. And... I am down about 55 pounds. That's amazing. So, uh, yeah, for me, you know, for, for an old guy. Well, just, I mean, just taking weight off your body is great. So yeah, so it's you good for your feet and your knees too. Yeah. We, yeah. we don't eat pasta anymore. Um, and when you think about it, yeah, pasta is not that great of a dish, at least in my opinion. Uh, it's, it's more of a, um, a medium to carry the sauce to your mouth. It's a it's a sauce delivery device, yeah. That's it. That's it. Yeah. I was thinking about the crunchy bottom of the rice because uh, Samin Nosrat, uh, she just, I think they temporarily suspended their podcast. They said they were done, but then hinted that they might do more episodes. It's called Home Cooking, mm. and she does it with a gentleman named Rishi. I'm messing up his last name. I I will go back and find that, but in. Iran, she's Persian, and uh, in what was Persia and is now Iran, rice is king. And there's a particular rice dish that she talks about many times in the podcast, and every family has their own version of it. But the ultimate part of the rice dish is the crunchy bottom and edges. And amongst a lot of families, I think amongst the siblings, there's a race or a battle to who gets to eat the crunchy part. Ah, yeah. You know, I think they went over that in the, um, they did a, a, a little series, TV series on that. Uh, her book is called Salt, Fat, Acid, Heat. Yes. And uh, she is really a great, uh, a great cook and a, a great teacher. And I, I remember that, you know, everybody was fighting over the crunchy rice in the bottom of the pan. It's on Netflix, too. Um, it's called Salt, Fat, Acid, Heat. I have the book. I've watched the Netflix series. Um, I now want to go to Italy and go to the cooking school that she went to mm -hmm. uh, in northern Italy. And I emailed them and I did not hear back. So I don't know if they're just booked up or sometimes my email ends up in people's spam folder. What is that? Uh, What's that all yeah. about? Yeah, well, sometimes just a little, little glitch of things. You know, um, do you know about Road Scholar, R-O-A-D Scholar? No. Uh, it's a travel company. And it's more than just travel anymore. They do experiences. And we've eyed this one tour they have. And you go to, I think it's Florence for two weeks. You bed and breakfast with a family. Uh, you're, you get half days off. And uh, you're in with a group of about eight or ten people. And uh, half cook one day, half the evening meal, half cook the next day. And you go out and you uh, gather all the fresh um uh, ingredients for the meal at the markets and come back and they teach you how they prepare them and that type of thing. And then you serve the, to the entire group, but then you have half days off every other day 
to uh, uh, in between classes and stuff to go and uh, uh, see sites and and uh, travel around. And the uh, train system in uh, in Italy is really fantastic. You can make a run to uh, from Florence to Naples or from Florence to uh, uh, Venice or Milan uh, if you're interested in that direction uh, and be back in you know a day. Uh, you might miss the evening meal that night, but you can make some pretty nice trips out of it. Nice. Hey, are you shopping locally? I am shopping locally as much as possible as well. If there's something that you need and you can't find it in your local stores and you're going to go on Amazon, would you consider using the Garden Fork Amazon link? It's in a, what's called an affiliate link. We get a finder's fee for sending you to Amazon. It helps pay the bills at the podcast world here. It is amazon.com slash shop slash garden fork. That's amazon.com slash shop slash garden fork. My first trip after the pandemic will be to a Waffle House. At the end of the runway of the St. Louis airport. Why St. Louis? Because my sister and mom live there now, and I need to go see them, and I'm going to land. I love Southwest Airlines. I'm going to take Southwest Airlines direct. I'm going to, my sister's going to pick me up. And literally at the far end of the airport where the, one of the, where the runways ends is a Waffle House. (laughs) And I'm going to sit at the counter and I'm going to be so happy. You know, there is a uh, book. It's a coffee table picture book you can buy of the view from Waffle Houses from all around the, the country. Ooh. <laughs> I should buy it and send it to you. It you a, should. A, a birthday present or something. By the way, the Home Cooking Show podcast, the gentleman's name is Rishi Hirway, And he has a podcast and Netflix show called Song Exploder. And it is fantastic. I am... I like music. My friends are in bands. I've never been in a band. I've managed bands. Um, really? Yeah. Well, in, in college, I did. And um, Eric, you have unsuspected depth. <laughs> well, they were all. I, I won't. I won't say. Don't get me started on trying to manage a band. But anyway, oh. Song Exploder is on Netflix, and it is really, really great. It just talks with. Um, Who's the guy that did uh, Hamilton? Uh, oh, anyway, that guy. That guy. Yeah. <laughs> All about this one song. And now you've got everyone yelling at the at the radios. <laughs> it's fantastic. So it's called uh, Rishi Hereway Song Exploder on Netflix, and also it's a podcast. Okay. I forgot to mention this while Rick and I were recording the podcast, but we're about to talk about e-bikes, and I'm going to talk about the new rad power bike I bought and rad power just sent me a coupon link for you. If you're interested in buying one of their bikes, they're going to knock some bucks off the price of the bike and they're going to send me a gift card as a thank you for referring you to rad power bikes. So if you consider using that link, I would appreciate that. All right, let's talk bikes. All right, something else that I wanted to talk about is uh, a electric bike update because we both have electric bikes. Yes, and I've been charging my battery. I brought it in for the winter because I didn't want it to freeze. I wasn't sure if that would be a problem or not. And um, I've been charging it. And uh, once I get my, my boot off my right foot and get into some shoes, I'm going to start riding my bike. I think I mentioned this in the previ- in the podcast previous, but I had an epiphany with... I have a Rad Power Bike. I love the company. I have a Rad City 4, which is kind of a traditional, what I would call a hybrid bike or a city bike. And I've realized the frame and tire size is too big for me. Ah, okay. And I also, my envision, my envision for using my e-bike in the city is to go places that either the subway doesn't go or I would usually have to drive my car to. And I I hate driving the car in the city and I'm just like trying to reduce my footprint and trying to promote electric everything. I mean, my house is solar powered. I want my bike to be solar powered. So I've decided to sell the Rad City 4 
mm-hmm. and I bought a cargo bike from Rad City. It's called the Rad. I forgot what it's called now. Anyway, um, but it is a step through cargo bike. It's it's boxier. It's more like a moped, and I love it because I can. I'm going to put a front uh, storage. Uh, great metal thing there i'm gonna put my baskets on the back of it and um i'm very oh it's a rad runner i got a rad runner and i got the one that has multiple gears you can get a single gear one or the multiple gear one so and then i'm thinking about getting i I thought about so i'm gonna sell the 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 second e-bike down there and i thought i might get one for up in the country as well because Whenever I go to visit my friends in the town or go to the store, you have to get in your car, yet it would be easily bikeable, yet we live in a town with very steep hills, and my ankles and knees hurt, so I'm thinking about that as well. You know, uh, one of the things, I did not get a red. I have a uh, uh, Karmic, Coben Karmic, uh, with two Ks, Coben, K-O-B-I-N, Karmic, K-A-R-M-A-C, I think it is. But one of the things I didn't realize when I bought it is I spent almost, I spent a lot of money outfitting it with a bike rack and um, saddle bags and uh, a front carrier and um, setting it up so I could pull a trailer and that kind of thing. And, you know, these rad bikes, uh, particularly the cargo bikes, yep. come designed for that, first of all. But also, and you know, like they have the dual kickstand, so it sits level. Yep. Yep. And uh, and then it has the cargo carriers and everything on it. And I kind of wish that I'd gotten something like that. Um, I think it would have uh, suited my needs a little bit better. I do. It's called the Rad Runner Plus. The Rad Runner is the cargo bike with a single speed. And Rad Runner Plus has a seven gear. I think it's called a cassette on the back wheel. And yes. it has fat tire bikes rather than skinny tire bikes. And the um, the major road in Brooklyn that I live two blocks off of is Fourth Avenue. It's 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 like a boulevard or a parkway, but riding your bike on it is insane. So the city, to their credit, created a uh, bike lane right off the sidewalk, and then mm-hmm. there's car parking, and then the two lanes of traffic. Ah. Uh-huh. But it's 65 blocks long, which is fantastic. But the problem in urban areas is where's all the trash from a road goes? It goes into the curb. Right. So you're, you've got a nice, what I call like a city bike. You know, it's got thin tires. There are potholes. There's pieces of a crate or someone dumped a bag. And I love the divided bikeway so I don't get hit by cars. But um, the ride is pretty rough. So with the cargo bike, I've got the fatter tires. The suspension's tuned a little better. I think it's a little more rugged. And it's a little more easier to ride uh, in a city way, I guess, is, if that makes any sense. So I'm very excited about that. It just puts a big smile on my face. Well, I, you know, I smile all the time when I ride the bike. Uh, it, it's uh, I am exploring the possibility of putting a trailer on it. I set it up to haul a trailer, but I haven't bought a trailer yet. And uh, actually pull the dogs over to the dog park, uh, yeah, which is great. Yeah, five, six miles. Uh, the dogs have a good time, ears flopping in the wind. And, uh, you know, I'd get some good exercise. But, uh, yeah, I think um, there are a lot of things. Uh, you know, we have a lot of, oh, what can I say, bike resentment among some drivers here. <laughs> yeah, in Brooklyn, and, too. Yeah, which is, uh, this is bicycle heaven, Uh Virginia Beach is an alluvial plain. It yes. literally it's it's flat. There is uh, other than overpasses over pieces of water, there is no elevation to this place at all. It is the perfect bike area. And uh, they you know uh, sometimes um, people just get really upset about bicycles for some reason. Um, and and I've seen them not just yeah, you, lots of times they take it out on adults riding bikes and yeah. i've seen you know, people taking it out on kids riding bikes and um you know i'll, I'll copy down their number and call the police or something you know uh don't need to be 
bothering kids because you've got a problem with people riding bicycles. Yeah. The, um, the one thing with the uh, Rad Runner cargo bike is the seat I bought uh, – on Amazon, a different seat, a seat with springs in it, because the seat is quite hard. So it's an excellent bike. Mm. Uh, it's just the seat is kind of hard. So I got a springy, I got a, a stem, you know, the, the seat stem has a coil spring in it. And then the seat itself is what I would call an old man seat. It has, <laughs> it's a little wider and cushier and has two little springs in it. Yeah. And um, pr- the uh, one I bought for mine uh, was recommended by my um, urologist, I guess. Uh, it, you know, if you get older and your prostate begins to uh, swell, and first one thing, no, the last thing you need is that horn of the seat uh, banging you there all the time. And there are uh, certain seats that are good for um, older people riding these bikes. The only thing I missed is uh, you don't realize how much that horn on the seat allows you to ride without hands. Uh, you, that's yes. how you can, contr- that's how you control. And when that's gone, there's no riding without hands. The bike will go off, off track every time. Well, that's a good thing then. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm signaling my intentions to people, uh, you know, with both hands. <laughs> Get out of my way. No yeah. brakes. <laughs> and the other thing I've done is I light up like a fire truck. Um, when I ride my bike, I put on, I bought a good helmet yep. and there, uh, I know we talk about consumer reports all the time, but uh, they do. Uh, I did a review of helmets, and it turns out the one I bought initially uh, wasn't worth anything. In fact, I cracked it uh, in an accident, uh, which is supposed to happen. Yes. But it, it was such a minor little event that it probably shouldn't have happened that way. But you um, you get what you pay for with a good helmet. But I, I light this bike up um, because, um, you know, People coming toward me when I'm on the bike lane and they want to turn left into the parking lots. Lots of times they do not see you if you don't have a good light out there to catch their attention. Um, and then people running up behind you wanting to turn right into the parking lot. Same thing. You need a lot of light on the back of your bike uh, to keep from becoming a statistic. We have uh, uh, some bike club puts up uh, ghost bikes every time a um, a yep. bicyclist is killed. Uh, it's an old bike that's been painted white, and they chain it to a tree. And we got way too many of those things around here. So, everyone, just think about that when you see a bicyclist. Um, it's one less car, one less polluting vehicle on your road. And I don't know anyone that rides bicycles, any adults. They don't also pay road taxes when they, they uh, pay their, particularly here in Virginia, uh, when they buy gasoline for their car, when they pay taxes on their car. So it's not like bicyclists are getting a free ride. Uh, The kids do, but then their parents pay the road tax. (laughs) All right. I think uh, that was a typical Rick and Eric show all over the place, and I hope it made everyone smile. It made me smile. Did you smile, Rick? I smiled a lot. Well, cool. That's probably like the the best medicine right there. Yeah, today's my happy day. I mean, it's, I'm almost counting it like I'm getting out of prison or something. Well, we are in a way. In a way, so. yeah. All right, everyone. So radio at gardenfork.tv. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you, Rick, and we'll see you next week. And thanks for calling, my friend. We'll talk to you later. Garden Fork Radio is produced in Brooklyn, New York by Garden Fork Media, LLC. Our executive producer is Jimmy Gooch. You can learn more about Jimmy and the custom hollow books he makes at hollowbooks.com. The music for our show is licensed from audioblocks.com and uniquetracks.com.